Hello everyone, today I'm going to discuss Jordan Peterson's recent appearance at Ocon. You probably saw my video in which I said this was a bad idea, and before I get started I just want to reiterate that this was a bad idea. I saw Steve Simpson commenting on Facebook about this, reiterating the point. You've probably heard your own and Amy. Peacock say, all of the people in favor of this decision say, which is that we're not trying to reach Jordan Peterson. We're trying to reach his followers. Well, you definitely are reaching his followers, but with what message are you reaching them? Now consider if the demographics were switched. Let's just say that to keep things nice and parallel, but imagine there was a Jordan Peterson convention, and they invited some prominent objectivist. How would you as an objectivist interpret that invitation? Well, you would think, oh, Jordan Peterson fans see the value of objectivism. They see that there's something valuable in these ideas that they can learn from. Now that is exactly what Jordan Peterson fans think of an objectivist invitation to Jordan Peterson. Now you can say, oh, we're doing this to reach those fans with our ideas, but that's not what this, that's not the message this objectively sends. What they're looking at this and seeing is, oh, they invited Jordan Peterson because they think they have something to learn from Jordan Peterson. Why else would they invite him to their event? That's why it's so important that this is OCON, the Objectivist Conference. This is objectivists inviting somebody to their event. For what reason? What reason could there be other than that they think they have something to learn from him? Surely it couldn't be as so pathetic <laughs> that they're trying to send us a message by inviting our guy there. If they thought that, that would be bad too, and that's actually the truth. But that's not how they're going to interpret it. The reason you invite somebody to a conference in which people of a certain ideology show up is because you think that that person has something of value to offer to the people who will be at that conference. This is why it's so disingenuous to compare Peter Schiff's uh, appearance at uh, past uh, objectivist conferences with the invitation of Jordan Peterson to this one. They didn't pretend like they were inviting Peter Schiff because we're trying to get at Schiff's libertarian followers. That wasn't the idea at all. It's we have something to learn from Peter Schiff. But now with Jordan Peterson, it's completely different. It's, oh yeah, we know he's wrong and we disagree with him on all the important philosophical issues and you don't really have anything to learn positively from him. Maybe you'll learn some ways he goes wrong, but really we're doing this to broadcast to his followers. That is entirely different from the kind of thing they've done before. So yeah, you're sending uh, his followers a message. You're sending them the message that, oh, objectivists realize that our guy is the guy. Why would we check out objectivism if even they recognize that our guy is the guy? They're inviting us to their conference. Clearly, we already know what's going on. Why would we check out objectivism if it's that lacking in confidence? So anyway, all of that just to reiterate why this was a terrible decision. So I have cut this video down from the original hour and 40 minutes to a little less than 30 minutes. So I'll be commenting on about a little less than a third of the actual content, the actual length of the original video. Now I've added in my logo to this video so that you can see when I've skipped time, I want it to be clear. Uh, I'll be stopping throughout, even, you know, not just when I skip time, but whenever you see my little gear logo with the phi symbol and the dollar sign, that means skipping ahead. The next thing you see is going to take place sometime after the last part of the clip you saw. 
So I'm going to play this and comment on it. Oh, and uh, here's Rucka. I just noticed. I didn't notice that or do that on purpose. He's right here, almost dead center, and that other guy from uh, one of Rucka's videos one time. Anyway, let's uh, get started. All right, so first off, to be. Oh, also, the volume fluctuates uh, significantly, which is a problem with the original video, and there's not a lot I can do about that. But I think it stables, stabilizes uh, after the beginning. Again, we are live streaming this on my channel, and as I'm sure many of you guys saw, I was on Joe Rogan's show a couple weeks ago, and we talked a little bit about <laughs> objectivism, and he said that you guys are very serious people, that you're, you're no. very serious people. So I need you guys to go absolutely bananas for the thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of people that will be watching this at home. Can you make some noise, you crazy <laughs> Day. Look at you guys, you crazy objectivists. All right. <laughs> you're, such someone... a, you're such a negative influence, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, well, never, last, I've never seen them like this. Last time, <laughs> last time I did an event with you guys, we had the whole audience screaming out George Carlin's seven dirty words. That's I, true. That's true. Well, not to be a prude, but I hardly think that is appropriate anywhere, really. That's, I mean... That is just, especially at an objectivist conference. Like this is the this is how they're trying to make objectivism cool. Yeah, let's uh, let's have people come up and let's swear more and be vulgar. I mean, whatever. I'm not against swearing all the time, but there is such a thing as uh, propriety. There is such a thing as something being appropriate. Now and not then, and there is such a thing as uh, social standards, and I don't like how in yet another attempt to appease the mainstream, the whole tone of Ocon is, oh, let's show them we're cool and hip and normal and let's swear and let's do all this uh, stupid, uh, casually vulgar stuff. I mean, whatever, there's some, there's some comedy that I think is funny. And sometimes it's even because of the swearing, but that has a time and a place. And this is not the time or the place. Uh, so Jordan, we've been on tour now for almost two months, and we have a little break right now, but I thought, why don't we just dive right back into all the things we've been talking about. So much of your, your tour for your 12 Rules for Life book has been about the role of the individual. So before we get too deep in, into philosophy and, and some of the other things, I thought that would be the right place to start because that's sort of what unifies all four of us up here. Yeah, well, I've been making the case, I suppose, or, or developing the argument. And it's an argument everybody knows to some degree, although I don't think we've done a very good job of articulating it um, over the last few decades that, you know, it's, it's no secret that our free societies, or the free societies of the world, are predicated on the idea of the sovereign individual, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the place where political power ultimately resides, or let's say political authority. But, and it's also, in some sense, the derivation source of the idea of rights, the fact that the individual is sovereign, the individual has inalienable rights. And we talk a lot about rights in our society, <clears throat> way too much as far as I'm concerned. Not that they're not important, but they're secondary because the fundamental uh, issue of import with regards to individual sovereignty isn't rights, it's responsibility. I mean, first of all, you could make a case that your rights are my responsibility and vice versa. So, so there's a parallelism between rights and responsibility. But even more importantly, if the integrity of the state is dependent on the integrity of the individual, and, and, and that's the argument that's implicit in the idea that the individual is sovereign, then it's obviously the case that the individual has a great responsibility, and it's a responsibility that's of incre incredible importance because it's not just limited to you. It's, 
It's you, you acting responsibly actually constitutes the bedrock of the state. And so, so that's an interesting issue. I mean, it, 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 it means that you're required in some sense to take responsibility or the entire state will shake. And I think that's true for everyone. But more interestingly, <clears throat> I think this is a more interesting argument in some sense, is that you need a meaning to sustain you through life or you need meaning perhaps not a meaning. You need meaning to sustain you through life because life is bitterly difficult and, um, and, 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 and ultimately challenging, mortally challenging for that matter. And you need a meaning to sustain you through that so that it doesn't embitter you and turn you into a victim, let's say. And it's pretty obvious to me, and I think obvious to anyone when they think it through, that virtually everything that you derive genuine meaning from, and I mean the kind of meaning that will sustain you when times are difficult, I don't mean casual happiness, even though there's nothing wrong with happiness, what the, the meaning that will sustain you through the tragedy of life is always to be found in the adoption of responsibility. And the people that you admire spontaneously, and I don't think there's an exception to this unless you're a little on the psychopathic side, and I mean that technically, um, you, you feel, I do, I mean, I mean it technically, it's like a, it's a hallmark of psychopathy, I would say. Generally speaking, you admire yourself to the degree that you do when you're at least taking care of yourself, at least that, and maybe when you have a little responsibility left over for your family and maybe some to spill over for the broader community, and certainly the people that you spontaneously admire in your, in your fellow men are people who, at minimum, are accounting for, their, for the burden of themselves, at, at minimum that, but then who have excess capacity and devote that to the proper care of their family and their community. And so I don't think that we've done a good job of laying out the meaning equals responsibility uh, equation. And it's, it's vitally important. And I think it's very helpful for people to learn that. Lots of people have told me that, that, that you know, that they've been getting their lives together and digging them out of a, selves out of a nihilistic and hopeless hole and doing that by understanding that the meaning they need to sustain them is to be found through the adoption of the maximal responsibility they can sustain. And so, well, that's, that's become clearer to me over the course. Okay. First, yeah, you see me changing the volume constantly. That's because whoever was running this kept upping and lowering the volume and I have to keep trying to compensate for it. Hopefully it turns out uh, listenable. So anybody who starts talking about how responsibility is more important than rights, that's number one. Now, what does that mean? You know damn well what that means. That means when your rights come into conflict with your duty to whatever, God, society, the state, in Jordan Peterson's view, you know which side Jordan Peterson is going to take. And it's not going to be the side of your right to choose for yourself. It's going to be the side of the state facilitating your uh, doing of your duty. So as soon as somebody puts rights versus duty, I mean, I mean, rights versus, uh, yeah, responsibility, you should immediately be suspicious because these things don't conflict. And the only reason to set them at odds with each other is because you are going to put one over the other. And it's clear which one Jordan Peterson is going to put over which other. Now, second, what does he regard as your responsibility? Well, he says, at least in this dismissive way, at least yourself as a minimum. But that's not, you know, that's minimum. Really, for your family, ultimately, your community. Responsibility, which is how you get your meaning, your sense of meaning. Responsibility means sacrifice for other people. In fact, for the group that's your responsibility and you know what people are talking too much about rights so we need to have more responsibility more collectivism more forced altruism 
Now, the other thing is his dismissal of happiness here. Now, Jordan Peterson actually says that the idea that the purpose of life is to pursue happiness is stupid. Now, this is for all of you defenders of Jordan Peterson. I would like you to consider whether it's possible to be honest and call the pursuit of happiness stupid. Now, because he is an altruist, he identifies morality with sacrifice, obviously, happiness fine, okay, if, if you happen to get it, he says, but really what's moral is sacrificing for your community. And then you'll feel meaning. And part of the view here comes from his religious intrinsicism. It comes from this uh, fear of subjectivity and uh, lack of certainty and anxiety over if, you know, if, if something depends on my experiencing happiness, if that's ultimately the cash value of what I'm doing, well, in Jordan Peterson's view, life is tragedy. Life is misery. So we have to find some way to get people to survive, to continue to try to survive and continue to exist in this miserable world, even though it is miserable. Now, why should you exist even though it's miserable? No answer. He just takes that as that's that's just the given. We have to find out some way to make people want to stay alive and continue to exist even though life is miserable. In fact, he says that the hardest thing about this argument is that it's so good. He isn't fully convinced that just killing yourself isn't the right thing to do, obviously. And the only way he's found out of that is not that you can actually rationally expect to achieve happiness in your life. It's that actually we should just get rid of happiness. Don't even worry about that. What you should strive for is meaning, not happiness, meaning, which is, according to him, that state of consciousness you get when you are fulfilling your moral duty to the collective, when you're sacrificing appropriately. Now, for anybody who thinks that this is just semantics, this is just an issue of language, and really when he says happiness, he means transitory pleasure, and when he says meaning, he means what we as objectivists mean by happiness. Wrong. Wrong. What he means by happiness is happiness, but also transitory pleasure. What he means by meaning is moral relief. It is the assuaging of guilt. What he means by meaning is precisely that emotion Bill Gates feels when he gives billions of dollars away. That's what he means. When you set your own self-interest against morality, now you have a big problem. Because pursuing things that are in your self-interest will probably bring you physical pleasure, but it will be shallow and you'll feel awful and guilty. Pursuing morality will make you feel miserable in terms of uh, physical feeling because you will be sacrificing the values you need to survive. It will also have a psychological cost, but the best you can hope for then is you retain some sense of morality. In fact, it's a moral relief. It's not even a positive. It's, it's like Ayn Rand said, you're just buying your life one dime at a time as you're giving it to bums on the street. That is the meaning Jordan Peterson is talking about. His highest conception of the thing he thinks should make you continue to endure this miserable existence is the feeling you get when you are a guilt-ridden, uh, successful, but uh, ideologically altruistic person. And he thinks, well, you should uh, sacrifice and do your duty so that even though you won't be happy, you will feel this sense of meaning, which is really just uh, temporary moral relief. That is no way to live. So Jordan Peterson is not an advocate of happiness. He doesn't actually have a good reason you should continue to remain in this world if you aren't going to pursue your self-interest, and he's no advocate of freedom. This is what's <laughs> funny to me. People say, oh, well, you know what? It's good Jordan Peterson should be here. He needs objectivists to clarify uh, his ideas with their principles. No, he doesn't. 
He needs to throw out all of his ideas. I mean, this is... <laughs> this comes from... I mean, so many objectivists and people in general are just so concrete bound and political. This is what I like about Raka. He never wants to talk about politics first or essentially. Because politics is the last thing. That's the most derivative thing. But so many people are like, oh, Jordan Peterson, he's anti-SJW. And he pays lip service to capitalism. Therefore, he's essentially fine. And all of the metaphysics and epistemology and ethics, the fact that he believes that reality is literally subjective and is created by consciousness, the fact that he thinks you should sacrifice for the community, the fact that he thinks reason is impotent and you know things through uh, mysticism and your blood, this very Nazi uh, idea. All of that doesn't matter because he's anti-SJW, so he just needs some clarity. No. Jordan Peterson... <laughs> if Jordan Peterson just needs clarity, then so did Hitler. Is all Hitler needed clarity? Was that all Hitler needed? No. But so many of these people on Jordan Peterson's side, if you're on Jordan Peterson's side, essentially, and you think, oh, I just need some tweaking, you are exactly the kind of person who would have been waving that swastika flag in the 1930s and then saying, oh, but Hitler's anti-communist. He's anti-communist. He hates the right people politically. So all he needs is a little bit of clarity because look, he's, it's not only just that he's negative, he hates the right people. And then, eh, okay, he's a little bit for the right ideas politically a little bit uh, but then you're on the most superficial level so he's negative on the most derivative level and that's good enough for you <laughs> and then yeah yeah you'll see what kind of capitalism Jordan Peterson advocates because you know he's totally fine with regulating Facebook and all of that he thinks oh that's fine why because they have a duty Right? The state has to come in and see, are they doing, are, are they spreading information in a way that uh, is in accordance with the public good? That's the kind of capitalism, it's really fascism, Jordan Peterson advocates. And this is why it's so dangerous to align yourself with Jordan Peterson because he uses the name capitalism. Because he says capitalism, what he means is fascism. And what you're doing is playing into the hands of the left who also identify capitalism with fascism. And you're just helping them make that argument when you bring Jordan Peterson into the fold and say, he's one of our guys. No, he's not, not even politically. <sighs> Course of these last, let's say 50 lectures, so. Greg, I saw you nodding along there a lot. Can you put some of this within an objectivist frame? Yeah, well, I mean, not to plug, but I gave a talk at actually the event that I met you at called Taking Responsibility for Your Happiness. Um, I think I have a bit of a different view of happiness than you do, and, that, and Rand has a different one you, than you do, um, where what I mean by happiness isn't the transient joy or emotion you could feel in a moment, but the, the state of being, the state of emotion that comes from accomplishing, achieving your values, having taken responsibility, set yourself goals, and leading a life where you're achieving those goals over time. And I think that's what ethics is about. I think that's what gives meaning to life. And I, a really deep part of that is taking responsibility for yourself. I would, I a little bit bristle at the idea of saying that responsibility is more important than rights or the reverse. I think they're, they're issues that come up at a different tier. So I think taking responsibility for yourself is a matter of ethics. It's a matter of how you live your own life. It's a matter of how you lead a life worth living and be happy and have meaning. I think those go together. Um, but then rights are the conditions that we need when we organize as a society to make everybody able to do that, not yeah, to be imp fine. impinging on each other. And if we don't all value our own lives and happiness, if we're not all taking responsibility, or at least if, if many of us aren't, we're not going to have a society that cares about rights and they're going to go away. And um, so in that sense, I agree, we need to have this shift to talking about ethics and uh, what we want to make of our lives, each of us. He's getting at something which is actually true here. There is a uh, relationship between rights and responsibility that's interesting. You can't have responsibility 
unless your rights are protected, you can't actually sunder these two things. One, because as Jordan Peterson indicated, if you uh, don't accept responsibility for defending a free society and doing what's right, you will ultimately lose your rights, or rather the protection of your rights. But also, and this Jordan Peterson doesn't seem to understand, you can't actually take responsibility unless your rights are respected. I mean, everybody knows if, if you're an altruist, okay, the government taxes you and provides welfare to people. Well, that's, now they forced you to do it. There's no morality involved. If you think giving charity is moral, you get moral credit. You can take the responsibility of giving to charity when you are left your own money and you get to choose what to do with it. If somebody forces you to do it, now the morality is gone. There is no responsibility. Responsibility requires making a choice. It's a chosen obligation. So if you're going to have actual responsibility, a precondition of that is that your rights are respected. So it's an interesting relationship. Again, I have problems with uh, what Jordan Peterson said, and I think Greg should have brought up how separating those two is disastrous and also have challenged... Uh, Jordan Peterson's conception of responsibility because clearly he is not uh, clear enough on this concept. He is clearly conflating it with duty and I'm sure he would weasel around and if you tried to pin him down he would say, oh well no, I actually meant this, but then he'd continue. He'd say, oh no, I meant chosen re responsibility, chosen obligation, but then he'd continue using it in a way that implies duty. So clearly Jordan Peterson is uh, conceptually confused and dishonestly so but anyway that was a uh, uh, just a point I wanted to make there I, I don't see I mean it, it, it is collectivism versus individualism I think the fundamental polarizing force that's 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 at work at the moment and the issue with the collectivist types is whether or not they're collectivist because they care about the dispossessed, which is their fundamental claim, or whether they're collectivist because they don't want to bear any of the responsibility that would go along with being a responsible individual. And, you know, I'm always skeptical of the, of the saint-like moral claims that are put forth by people who are pushing a given ideology. So this is, of course, the idea that Stalin is bad because he doesn't really care about poor people. That's the argument here. That's what he says. The real issue with collectivists is whether they are sincerely concerned with the poor. That's the big problem here. This is, this is one of the weaknesses of the rationalist argument, I think, <clears throat> is that we have to use heuristics to operate in the world. So heuristics are, simpl are, are simplifying maneuvers. And we, there's no option. You have to use heuristics. And the reason for that is because there is a lot more world than there is of you. And so you take this incredibly complex reality and you simplify it. And now the simplifications have to have merit and, and what makes them have merit is, is grounds for a, is a topic for a very long, lengthy discussion. But to produce those simplifications, you have to use hu heuristics. You have to use cognitive shortcuts. And it looks to me like narrative is a heuristic and that the reason that we need to tell stories and, and that we probably need to have our ethic grounded in stories is because you can't make a list of rules that will tell you how to live. Mm -hmm. Rules don't suffice, but you can tell stories that are that lay out broad principles and those Why can't you just name the broad principles then? Why is that so hard? Why does it have to be a story? Why does it have to be metaphorical? Oh, because it's woozy, vague, unclear, nonsense, mystical nonsense, open to infinite interpretation that you can just change on the fly. It's not really a rule at all. It's mystical nonsense. It's emotionalism. That's what it is. That's what Jordan Peterson's sense of meaning is, by the way. If you've ever heard him talk about that, how you know when you're actually engaging in meaningful action, which he says is the purpose of life, you just feel it. You just feel it. You kind of have this uh, 
cosmic uh, antenna and you just feel in tune with the universe when you're doing the right thing you just know when you're uh, saying something that you shouldn't say or or doing something wrong you just know essentially he's he's not really saying anything more uh, sophisticated than trust your heart that's what Jordan Peterson says as a method for knowing what to do anyway as far as the uh, idea that this has to be embedded in narrative well uh, uh, embodying principles in fiction is extremely valuable both for the emotional fuel it gives you but also it's a cognitive aid Ayn Rand said she knew many people who would tell her that they could get uh, a lead on what to do by thinking about what Howard Rourke would do because seeing it embodied in that way seeing Rourke as a human being actually acting in the world uh, makes it clear what those principles actually mean concretely so yeah there's totally a value to that yet those principles must also be named explicitly outside of narrative if you are going to be able to follow them you can't just have it in the book i mean if you could why did ayn rand make leonard peikoff promise to write uh opar what's the point you can just read out Shroud. just do what her characters do that's not enough now she also said it's not enough just to know the principles uh, in a sense you actually have to to read the art to know what it act what these principles actually mean but you can't just have the art you need both uh, if you if you think you can just have the art then what you're really what you're really fighting for is the right to be mystical and vague and not uh, to mean anything in particular at all which is exactly what Jordan Peterson wants but yeah if the narratives embody principles why can't you just name the principles oh you can't because they're mystical nonsense that aren't really principles at all they actually don't have any definition because they're based on emotions and there's no way to define how you're going to feel in this moment or the next it's just divine messages from the universe telling you what to do and there's no way to rationally define that because it doesn't actually mean anything it's just subjective and random those are heuristic principles now but the thing is is that the most fundamental stories seem to have a religious core now I'm not exactly sure why that is although I think it probably has to do with something I referred to earlier which is the idea that you know you are as a soul you're the thing that transforms potential into actuality that seems to be the grounding concept in some sense so that's the grounding concept there's something divine about that out of that arises a sequence of, of stories that are shaped across perhaps evolutionary history and inside that our more articulated ethic exists and I don't see a way out of that because you cannot make an exhaustive list of rules that enable ethical movement forward and you need to do that if you had a purely rational view of the way that human cognition functions it's okay. something like that so let's let's pause right there so this is <laughs> uh this is some great irony here is jordan peterson criticizing reason because the rules it gives you are too narrow that that is that is exactly the opposite of the truth you remember when Ayn Rand said about religion it's like canned philosophy because religion gives you these concrete bound rules don't eat pigs don't shave your beard it's these narrow narrow concretes just gives you these canned rules whereas philosophy gives you abstract principles that you can apply across time in a much wider greater context uh, the the uh, rules you get from philosophy the principles you get from, from philosophy uh, apply in all kinds of contexts that thou shalt not shave <laughs> your beard will not apply in so it's I mean this is uh, Jordan Peterson accusing reason of 
precisely what religion does and reason allows you to do better than. Can either one of you figure out a way out of that? I mean, that, right? that would be the, the answer that an objectivist would want to have, right? Here we are. We got a whole bunch of them right in front of you. So I don't think you could have a list of rules if the rule... Also, this is far from the most important problem I have with Greg and your own here, but you know, it would be nice to have one objectivist on the stage who didn't have a speech impediment. I'm not going to make fun of them for it, but when your job is to speak publicly, that's not irrelevant. That might be something you consider when your job is to speak to people publicly. You might consider fixing that, or at least not treat it as something, oh, you, we can't talk about that. Nobody can talk about that. You mean something like an algorithm that you that's live your I life exactly by. Exactly mean I think, an algorithm. I think that's just not something we can do. That's not the way the human mind works, and the world is complicated, and you're not going to get a bunch of if-then statements that take you, uh, take you to... But I mean, you can't even do that for a lot of physical systems, to a point. Right, right. Um, but I think we can understand them rationally. I, it's, now, this might be similar to what we were talking about in the green room about Sam's view of reason and yours and mine. We might got to figure out where they all uh, lie. But I don't think reason is just about coming up with algorithms. I think we come up with concepts. Concepts enable us to assimilate vast quantities of similar things to one another and uh, learn from future inst about future instances from past ones. We can get quite subtle um, principles, but I think moral principles are not things that take the form of simple rules, don't lie. They're, um, to take Rand's version of the virtue of honesty, which isn't don't lie, it's, um, it's your recognition of the fact that what's unreal is unreal and it can't be of value. So faking things won't work. It won't make them real. Somehow the thing you fake is going to come back to haunt you. That's not a, a, a simple rule of what to do in each situation. It's a kind of broad fact that you can use to steer your life by. And in order to use it to steer your life by and to fully understand it, you need to think about how it plays out in a lot of different contexts, right? You need to think about what it really means in practice and art uh, stories, but you know, literature, but also other forms of art, I think, are an indispensable means to doing this, both with ethical truths like this and also with other uh, metaphysical truths, views about what kind of world we're in. So, okay. That was an important little bit of appeasement there by Greg. What Jordan Peterson is saying here is that reason produces clarity by virtue of the fact that it is specific. It produces specific rules, and that's how you have clarity. But what really matters are these general principles, and that is outside of the province of reason. Once you get to principles, there's no clarity. They're woozy. They move around. They're not algorithmic. What does algorithmic mean? It means clear. You can always follow this. And to him, being able to uh, know that something will work is an attribute of very, very narrow, specific things. It's not an attribute of principles. Principles are inherently fuzzy and vague, and they have to be to incorporate more than one instance. How could they be clear if they cover a range of instances? So this is a basic epistemological conceptual problem Jordan Peterson has. And my problem is that Greg appeases this conflation and says, oh yeah, yeah, you know, uh, reason it isn't algorithmic, but it is. You can apply on the broadest level, you can apply the process of reason at any time, anywhere, with any level of knowledge. You can apply it and it will work. It's very abstract. That's true. It's not as specific as uh, put your microscope right here and observe uh, this molecule of matter or whatever. 
It's very broad, but it is still precise. But for Jordan Peterson, if it's going to be very broad, it has to be hazy. If it's going to cover a range of situations, it can't be precise. How can it be precise if it's not tailored to one specific situation? But reason is like an algorithm. You use the same method. No matter what concretes you're dealing with, the rules of conceptualization and conceptual identification and deduction and induction, they don't change. And as I say, I'm not just talking about deduction here, which is what people usually mean when they refer to logic. No, logic, reason, that works across time everywhere. It is an algorithm. It is an if-then. But Jordan Peterson is saying, oh, well, reason uh, only works uh, on uh, a very narrow range of things. That's, that's, that's the application of reason. But if you're going to be broad, if you're going to be principled, well, reason, that's just not reason's realm because it's inherently the realm of being fuzzy and hazy. So he's setting uh, broadness uh, against uh, clarity. He's saying if you're broad, you're fuzzy. If you're clear, if you're precise, then you're narrow. That's not true. And Greg's response just capitulates on that entirely. No, following a system that will work definitely every time is not something that only applies on the very narrow level. Being able to apply something across space and time, that is not something that only works narrowly. Reason doesn't, your method doesn't have to be hazy, it doesn't have to be mystical in order to account for all of the cognition or mental processes you're going to have to go through. Reason can be both definite and apply across all instances and facts and uh, problems you'll ever encounter. These are not at odds. Durability and definition are not at odds. Broadness and definition are not at odds. That's the principle here. But Jordan Peterson is saying, no, if you're broad, you're hazy. If you're clear, you're narrow. No. I don't see us as, we've got some choice over here, but we're really driven by the subconscious. And the subconscious is there for me to explore, and I become a better person as I know my subconscious better. I understand where my emotions are coming from, and I understand that better. But at the end of the day, when I make a choice out there, it's based on reality and facts and see the, 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 see and I, and I see reality of facts i don't see anything coming between me and this and this plastic bottle that again uh, uh, my simplistic view right here's the here's the plastic bottle i can see it it's a plastic bottle and and uh, it's not something else now there's a lot that goes into what is plastic what is bottle what is that but but that's what it is i can describe it i can actually if i had the scientific knowledge get down into the molecular structure and it's real it's actually here it's not created by my consciousness or interpreted by my consciousness. It really is what it is. So I, I think what evolution has done is given us those tools. Let, to let me ask you a that. question. Sure. <laughs> why is this? Why is a stump and a beanbag both a chair? <laughs> well, because you're talking about why the self. Why is a stump yeah. and a beanbag both a chair? So this was awful. So Euron insists on having Jordan Peterson come to this conference. And then is on stage for the discussion and has clearly not watched enough Jordan Peterson to be on the stage with him or to know that inviting him is a good idea. If he had done his due diligence, he would have been able to 
knock this softball out of the park. If, <sighs> he should have known this was coming. And as an objectivist, he should know exactly how to demolish the implication Jordan Peterson is making. So it is just, it is, you know, my problem here is not that Yaron is taken aback by this question. Whatever. My problem is that he is the one justifying bringing Jordan Peterson here and then getting on stage with him while being too inept to deal with Jordan Peterson's criticism of objectivism. And his view is, oh, well, oh, objectivists, you shouldn't be afraid to bring Jordan Peterson here. If you know our ideas are right, why are you afraid of debating him? And then he gets up there and is incapable of debating him and doesn't know what Jordan Peterson's talking about or where he's coming from. Clearly has not done his due diligence with regard to Jordan Peterson's ideas. <sighs> okay, because if you have a proper definition of a chair, then a stump and a big bag both fit that definition. What is the Some, definition? Well, I haven't thought about it, but you know, something to sit in. That's um, it. Yeah. So it's something to sit on. Yeah. Right. That isn't inherent to the object. Sure. No. no. Truth. The, see, the, the, no. But my my see, definition definitions are not inherent in the object. Mm -hmm. The 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 objectively created but, by, by by you know my consciousness and that object. Right. But the but, object is an object. Right. It is a, It is. It's both of them are chairs, and both of them have a particular nature. That is, I can describe both, I can both say the stump and the beanbag are the same, they're a chair, but I can also say they're different. The stump is made of wood and it has this, well, like, see, and the beanbag is the different. The problem with the idea that the object presents itself is that two things are the same and different in a near infinite number of ways. And that, that's also a technical problem, so sure. I, I can give you an example. So, Imagine that you're going to classify a set of six books. You're going to figure out how to arrange them in your shelf. You think, well, that's an easy thing to do. That's a conceptual problem, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's actually not an easy thing to do because there is an indefinite number of ways that you can... Let me just do this stump example before uh, I get lost in the other nonsense that is going to be said. The reason Jordan Peterson chose that example is because he is trying to dramatize the point that human knowledge is perspectival and specifically it is uh, based on our biological needs. We organize the world based on our biological needs. So this is true even perceptually, but the reason he chose uh, the stump and the beanbag is to dramatize this. You see, it's not just our perception of the stump and the beanbag that is determined by our uh, perceptual systems, our specific perceptual systems. It's that as furniture, these things are things we actually use. It's not like a cloud or a tree, which yes, we perceive in a human form, but they're out there, right? A stump uh, considered as a chair is considered as a chair because we use it for our purposes. And that's why he uses this example. He's trying to dramatize this, which is valid. But what Jordan Peterson does not understand is that the fact that it is useful to us as a chair, that it uh, aids us in sitting, facilitates our sitting, which in some uh, significant way aids our survival, is just another fact. You see, for Jordan Peterson, there are facts, but then we come into the equation. And when we start classifying things based on our needs, we introduce subjectivity into the picture. We introduce, uh, we impose things on nature. We, in a sense, create nature by observing it, by thinking about it. We are creating, we are altering the facts. That's not right. We are organizing the facts based on our needs, which is itself an implicit statement of fact. That fact being, this organization of nature facilitates our survival. So the reason you call a stump a chair 
is because we can sit on it to aid our survival. That doesn't change anything in reality. You're not creating reality in any sense. You are just making the implicit factual statement. You are recognizing the pre-existing fact that the stump is suitable for us to sit in. That is not something we create. It is something we recognize. It is something we identify. And the fact that what we're identifying is a relationship between existence and ourselves does not mean that we are creating it. We're not. We're identifying it. So this is Jordan Peterson's whole trick epistemologically, is that epistemology has a uh, biological value foundation. And he infers from this subjectivity, but that's not right. The fact that we organize the world in accordance with our needs does not mean that we are altering the world, that we're changing the facts. It just means we are taking account of the facts in accordance with our needs. That's it. Classify a finite number of objects. So you could classify the books by color, by age, by thickness, by weight, by number of E's, by number of A's, by number of E's on the first page, by number of words, by number of phrases. Yeah, but this is, by, this is but what Cooper is but, but this, right? is, this, this is, is a big problem. Why, because the question is, why am I classifying them? So that is the no question. Yes. The, there's no intrinsic value to classifying books. The question is, why do I want to classify them? And the, the answer to the why I want to classify them will then determine how I classify I, them. Absolutely, but, but that, that's it. exactly it. But that's the rub. The rub is, you see, that's the rub. Your, your classification system is dependent on why you apply it. And that's exactly the argument I've been using with Harris, which means the set of facts that reveal themselves to you in the world are dependent on your values. Because Sam's argument is that... Well, there are two things here. Um, past the perceptual level, no, that's not true. The facts that reveal themselves to you are just given. You don't create facts by organizing the world. You don't create... Whatever books are on that shelf are on that shelf. You don't create different facts by organizing them in different ways. You simply identify the further fact that your values require the organization of books in this way. And if you have uh, correct values based on life and happiness, then... Uh, Though that organization will facilitate your survival and uh, pursuit of survival values. Now, on the perceptual level, there's a sense in which Jordan Peterson's right. The facts we are made aware of does depend on our nature as biological organisms. I mean, we, div we have a specific form of perception. We see specific things. I mean, we don't perceive ultraviolet. Right? I mean, we don't have those, <laughs> what do sharks have? Some kind of way to sense electromagnetism. We don't have that. So the facts we see, both in form, not, not just form, but even the facts we are made aware of, there are things that we just don't see at all, facts we, we don't know because we don't have the senses for them. The facts we're made aware of uh, do depend on our needs, and we have developed this uh, our senses through uh, natural selection. This is just what natural selection has uh, caused us to have because this is what actually aids our survival. But the point here is that having a form of perception is not subjective. You are still aware of the world just in a certain form, but that's not subjective. You're still aware of the world. The fact that uh, evolutionarily we have uh, developed such that uh, perceptually we are aware of those facts that were historically, evolutionarily, most relevant to our survival, that doesn't say anything subjective. All that says is we don't know everything. So what? That doesn't change that what we know is what we know. I mean, this is, you see this confusion everywhere. People think you either have omniscience or you have to be a total skeptic and you can't know anything. Why? 
It is totally possible, and this is actually the case for everyone, that you know what you know without knowing everything. You can know what you know without knowing everything. The fact that we see only some of reality and in a certain form doesn't mean that we don't actually see that part of reality that we see. The values are derived from the facts. It's like, no, wait a minute. There's an infinite number of facts and they present themselves in accordance with your values, with your, with your purpose. And so that, that demolishes the values from facts argument. Now it makes it complicated because there's an interrelationship. Why does that demolish that? I like that hand thing he did. That was actually a really good way of, of showing that. I sincerely really like that. That was a cool and uh, evocative and clarifying gesture. I, I gesticulate a lot myself, so maybe I have a bias toward that kind of thing, but I like that. Anyway, why does this destroy uh, values from facts? I'm waiting to hear his answer on this. Between, like a causal interrelationship. Sure. But it is the case that your purpose determines the facts that array themselves before you. And, and that's actually oh. not just... Right. So he's saying, well, your values determine how you organize reality. Yes, but your values depend on the fact of your biological requirements. That is not some subjective thing you bring to the table. The fact that you organize books according to uh, content or alphabetical order or whatever works best for you given your purpose depends on your needs as a biological organism. Now, yes, there's a lot of links in that chain. You're organizing them alphabetically because you have a job that requires that for some reason and you have a job because you need to eat and you need to eat because you're a biological organism. Ultimately, the way that you order the world is a consequence of facts. You are getting values from facts. Facts about your needs as an organism. But he's treating it like it's just this subjective thing. You just bring it in and psh, you can have any values and just impose them and who can say? Now, here's the thing. He won't go into it here, but you know what Jordan Peterson's answer to this question is? Do you know what his answer is? His answer is that, yeah, there's an infinite number of ways to organize reality, to think about reality, to uh, impose your values on reality, an infinite number of values you could have. But there aren't an infinite number of ways you can get along with other people. So for him, the way you organize reality, your infinite subjectivity is constrained by your relationships with other people. And then he uses this to go back to uh, your requirements for survival and everything, but he makes that important detour there. This is weird in two ways. First of all, he's criticizing objectivism for basing values on the facts of our biological needs, which is ultimately where he goes with this, so that's weird, but it's important because it shows what's really important to him. You can't just go to your needs as an organism. No, no, no. You have to make this pit stop. You have to stop at the group. You have to stop there. You have to show. In fact, this is primary for him. What matters is that your values work in harmony with the group's values. And that's what constrains the infinity of subjectivity. Oh yeah, you can have infinite uh, interpretations, but there are only a limited number of interpretations that work with other people's subjective interpretations. That's how he constrains subjectivity. Not by reality, not by facts, your factual needs as an organism, but by other people's subjectivity. That's the way he gets... It. So. All you people who identify Jordan Peterson as this enemy of postmodernism, garbage. No, he is not. He agrees with them. And the way he, and his whole thing, the whole, this whole idea that he's a, an anti-postmodern crusader is a joke. 
I mean, this this would be like, <laughs> this is, you know what this is like? This is like somebody saying, I'm an anti-communist crusader. And then all of the capitalists welcoming him, when really, as an anti-communist crusader, he says, no, I don't believe the state should be in control for the proletariat. I think the state should be in control for the race. That's what Jordan Peterson is doing. No, I don't believe in infinite subjectivity. I believe in subjectivity constrained by other people's subjectivity. That's all he is. He's just a different flavor. He, he is as far away from objectivism as you can be, even in his antipathy to postmodernism. He doesn't constrain subjectivity uh, by facts. He doesn't say, oh, well, we can't be subjective because there are facts, factual requirements about us that tell us how to organize the world. No. The reason we can't organize the world just any old way we please is because, oh, other people have their own subjective preferences. This actually is why his stupid rat example is so important. This goes back to my last video where I was criticizing him. I think my last video where I talked about how he uh, does, the, he, he uh, elides the difference between altruism and egoism by saying that, well, what's in one person's interest is really in everybody else's interest. And what he means by this is subjective desire. That's how he defines interest. So his stupid rat example is, oh, the little rat will stop playing with the big rat if the big rat wins their game of wrestling too many times. So you see, it's not reality that constrains what the big rat can do. It's the subjective desire of the little rat. That is his great counter to postmodernism. This is your champion, all of you anti-postmodernists. Mutable, I would oh, say. No, no, the, the, the facts are, the actual facts are, no, <laughs> the actual fact is that I have six books, and the actual fact is that there's a infinite, if you will, way in which to order them, and that if I ordered them by E, this would be in it. If I ordered, so the facts are all there. Where my values introduced is how I'm going to order them, but uh, what the book well, or is even to order if them. they're books, but, 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 but the, no, the fact they that might be books firewood. Is not. They might be firewood. They might be a weapon. Yeah. There's yeah. lots of things they can be other than books. So this is and kind so of amusing to me because the first. <laughs> uh, no, seriously though, because the first uh, I, I study and have written quite a bit on concept formation and, and classification. Uh, but whenever I'm writing about it, I don't think I've ever said this before, um, I remember back to when I was a little kid and I had this bookshelf and I was ordering the books on the bookshelf and I was thinking, well, what's the right way to do it? Uh, and of course the answer is that there isn't one right way built into nature. Here's how everyone's got to put into the Dewey Decimal System and if not for Dewey, no one would have figured it out, right? There are um, a, a, lot of, example, a lot of different ways you can order books, but there are also, and anything else, right? But there are also the facts about the things yeah. that um, make it necessary to order them in certain ways uh, to achieve different purposes, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And to understand them. As long and as you add that last part of the phrase. And then there's very broad types of purposes we have to have in order to be able to think and function at all. Yes. Um, and those purposes, the purpose of getting to know as much of reality as we can, of holding that reality in a way that won't flummox us, uh, and therefore is unit economical is the word um, Rand sometimes uses for this, so a way that allows you to hold a lot of information in a compact number of units. Um, and then there are certain facts we need to know and other facts we don't because of our natures, you know, to navigate ourselves through the world, provide standards for how we uh, conceptualize things. Yes. So although our purposes and our needs as human beings matter, it's not as though any purpose is just as good as any other, and there's a, mm -hmm. you can come up with standards for objectivity of what, um, what is an objective way to form concepts and to classify, in the same way that you can come up with standards for what's an objective way to I don't think you can come up with brain. it, I agree with everything you said, except I don't think you can come up with it objectively. Well, I even the think there is a hierarchy though, of values, though. Take the sense of objective, though, that's involved in objective grading or objective reporting. Right? It's not that the grade's already out there in the paper and you just got to find it in there, or the newspaper story's already written and a good reporter will find it. It's rather there's a way, maybe not just one, but a small range of them, right? A way that this has to be done in order to accomplish the legitimate purposes for doing it.
Yes, the there's a finite mean, range of, uh, of organizing right. things that will enable you to use them in a, in a and reasonable that's way. that's what we mean when we talk about an article being written objectively, a paper being graded objectively. And I think in the same sense you could talk about a concept being formed objectively or values being formed objectively. Okay, but, okay. This is, I mean, this convinced me of the legitimacy of writing my book on life and consciousness. It can be hard to know, do other people already know this? Is this really original? But the fact that he is, he is so close, but he just won't say it. Why won't he say it? Why won't Greg get to the basis here? Get to the foundation, blast him, name the foundation. He is so close, but he just won't say it. Why won't he say that the way we organize the world depends not just on facts about those things and not just on facts about our purposes. Why won't he name that our purposes derive from our needs as organisms, our biological needs? That's the standard. How we relate to existence, that factual relationship determines the proper way. It determines the standards for organizing reality because we organize reality because we need to survive. I just, why? He's so close. Why won't he just say that? I don't understand, but this just convinced me that uh, what I'm saying is not obvious. Uh, it can be hard to know. Do people know uh, this already and they just don't say it? I haven't heard them say it. Is it obvious? And you know, philosophy is so, it's so uh, abstract and so interrelated that uh, it's often difficult to know what somebody had in mind or what he didn't, you know, with Aristotle and the law of identity. It's, did he know this? It's implicit in everything he said, but he never named it. Do you think it was too obvious or did he actually not get it? So it can be really tricky to know uh, what still needs to be said in a philosophical context. But the fact that Greg won't just name it, won't name the basis for uh, the legitimacy of a purpose, that basis being your needs as an organism, I, that's all he needs to say. He could be so clear and blast Jordan Peterson with this. Right, look. There's a, there's a lot in that. Well, there's a, there's a lot in that that, that I think is, is, is dead on. Like, I, I do believe, for example, that one of the ways we deal with the fact that there's a plethora of facts is that we impose interpretive structures on those facts that are common to all of us because we have common goals. Like, we don't want to suffer and die, generally speaking. We want to stay alive, and our biological systems predispose us to act in ways that are commensurate with that. And, and so... I Right, and then we organize the world for that purpose. And as long as we recognize that's what we're doing, that's fine, because that organization, it doesn't say that this organization is good outside of all context. It says that this organization is good for us. You know, it's like Ayn Rand's example of uh, how we don't have a concept for five foot tall, blue eyed, blonde haired women, something like that. Now, why don't we have a concept for that? Well, it's not that those uh, entities don't exist or that they don't exist with those actual similarities. It's that having that concept doesn't facilitate our lives. And so it's pointless to have it. We shouldn't have that concept because it's extraneous. So if they would just make the point that yes, life is the basis for organizing human knowledge but that doesn't make it subjective because it's still real knowledge of things out there and real knowledge of how they actually relate to us i don't this is i just don't understand why they're not they're just dancing around it just nailing i don't think there's an infinite number of solutions to the fact that there's an infinite number of problems that's where i think the postmodernists have gone wrong 
But I think that when you say that what you've produced by, by constraining the solution set is somehow akin to objectivity, that, that's where I have a conceptual problem. Even though I don't disagree with the reason that you would make that case, be, be, then I guess what would happen is we'd have to define what constitutes objective. Because right. when I think of objective, I think about the strict application of the scientific method. And what that's done for us is lay out a world, not of values, but of objective facts. If you're objective, you can lay out the objective facts, but I can't see how you can derive the damn values. Even though I do believe that there's a hierarchy of values and that there's a finite hierarchy, I don't think putting that into the category of objective truth is reasonable because I don't think that those truths are objective. There's some, there's, there's some other form of truth. Well, and I think that that's generally captured in something like metaphor and, and narrative, which I think... No, they're just truths about how we relate to the world. That's it. That's the defining characteristic of everything Jordan Peterson sees as mystical. It's as soon as it's related to us. That doesn't confuse anything. Why is that so confusing? You, you can determine that by strict application of the scientific method, as he said. You can determine cause and effect relationships between human beings and the external world. I think Dave's going to push us to move on in a minute. So yeah. I want to say well, one thing if I can before. I, I actually know. wasn't. I was thinking right. that maybe we'd dump the Q&A and just keep going because <laughs> I, I, so. Wow, applause for not asking questions. That's, uh, so I just wanted to, to say, about, I mean, so first, I totally agree. Uh, one of these issues We won't is, fully dump it. We'll, we'll do about 10 more here. One of these issues is how do we define objectivity? And this is another one of these classifying questions, right? Uh, and that's an interesting question. Where does this concept come from? There's a whole history to it. There have been books written about the history of the concept of objectivity, and that's something maybe for another occasion. But let's flag that as a really interesting question. As for, just want to say something about is ought before we, and also something about whether we can get to the same conclusion starting from different places. Um, I see what Harris is doing is he's in the tradition of a lot of empiricists. It goes back to Epicurus. It's definitely present in Mill and in a different kind of way in Hume, um, though very different in Hume and Adam Smith. Um, if you're an empiricist, you think everything comes from perception. And you usually have a kind of fairly atomized view of perception. You think that it's collections of sensations. And what these types of empiricists generally do when they get to ethics is they pick some sensation to identify their value terms with. So either pain, maybe the sensation of pain is, or the sensation of suffering is the one Sam uses, right, is the bad, and then whatever is opposite to that, pleasure is the good. Some of them say the sensation of desire fulfillment, or, but they pick some sensation, some simple psychological state that can be experienced in a moment, and identify that with the good, and then they come up with some theory about you know, how do we get as many of those moments or as much of them as possible? That's famously what John Stuart Mill does, Epicurus in a very different way. Um, and if you think you can derive values from facts like that, I, I, don't, I think that's the mistake. I don't even think that's really de deriving values from facts. All that's doing is identifying values with certain very, very simple facts. So what I think the real question about deriving values from facts is, is we have these value concepts, concepts like good and bad, that we use to direct our... Okay. So I thought this was the worst moment of the entire discussion. This is uh, utter appeasement of Jordan Peterson's religious intrinsicism. This is the equivalent of, <laughs> you know, you're talking to... Greg Salmieri is talking to a... He's talking to Descartes. And uh, he knows Descartes is a rationalist. And so he says, oh, yeah, you know what these empiricists have done? They've said that all knowledge comes from observation. Pfft, yeah, right. We, no, no, us objectivists, we understand logic. That's really important. Logic is really important. We, ag we agree with you. We see where you're coming from. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that logic comes from observation and what you are doing by throwing empiricism under the bus in the way greg did in this hypothetical scenario but really did uh in ethically here what you are doing there 
is throwing away what's actually right about empiricism in order to appease a rationalist, or as Greg is doing, you're throwing away what's right about, let's say, uh, hedonism or uh, <laughs> empirical uh, theories of ethics, which are generally hedonistic, in favor of appeasing an intrinsicist. Now, Jordan Peterson is very uncomfortable with the idea of identifying uh, values ultimately in terms of conscious experiences, like all religious people. Uh, one, because life is suffering, right? So if life is about being happy or it's about having conscious experiences worth having, uh, that's no good because then people are just going to kill themselves and Jordan Peterson has a dogmatic commitment to people not killing themselves no matter what, apparently, even if he thinks uh, living is hell. So he says, ooh, if we say that it's a conscious experience, that's uh, subjective and uh, uh, there's really not any good conscious experiences you're likely to have most of the time. So really it's intrinsic. The good is intrinsic out there. And what Greg is doing here is appeasing that by saying, oh yeah, these empiricists, they just identify certain simple sensations as, uh, as values. And uh, that's not what we as objectivists do. Now, I know what his response would be. And I totally understand the need to explain uh, the hierarchy involved here. And really this point is very simple, and I think Greg could have explained this much better. And it's as simple as this. Your, uh, the basis of values is the requirements of life. But those values are cashed out in terms of conscious experiences. But the basic empirical approach of understanding that the, the only thing that is intrinsically good is uh, feelings, to put it uh, provocatively. There is nothing else that is just intrinsically good. Even living isn't intrinsically good. Living is good because it feels good to live. Leonard Peikoff is actually said this, there would be no point in living if it didn't feel good. You can't rationalistically deduce a duty to live uh, intrinsically outside of the fact that living ultimately redounds to your conscious experience. Ayn Rand even said, man experiences the reality of his values in terms of pleasure. She doesn't even say <laughs> states of consciousness or even something as lofty as happiness, characteristically provocative Ayn Rand style. She says pleasure, blunt pleasure. And so that basic empirical approach of saying, okay, why should I even live? What's the point? What, why, why should I bother doing anything? What is actually the point of pursuing any value? Well, the point of pursuing any value is ultimately because of how you experience the reality of that value. Pleasure. That is the one and only reason to continue to pursue values and remain in existence. But there are two ends here. There's values, right? And there's what values cash out as, which is pleasure, happiness, feelings. But then there's the basis, the metaphysical basis of values. And this is what Ayn Rand understands that hedonists don't. The actual basis of values is the requirements of your life. The fact that you are an organism with specific needs creates the possibility of values by giving you a reason to pursue things. It gives you an alternative, a fundamental alternative, life or death. So the fact that life is contingent on the pursuit and achievement of values, that is the source of values. But 
the only reason to bother pursuing them is not because of how they enable you to continue surviving per se, but because of how they feel good to achieve. Now, of course, you have to survive as a precondition of experiencing them, but uh, Ayn Rand's discovery is that life is not just a precondition for experiencing happiness. Achieving life is actually what causes you to feel happy. So the empirical approach of, okay, let's see here. We want to feel good, but we also have to be alive in order to feel good. So let's see, how do we maximize pleasure while staying alive? And Ayn Rand discovered those are the same thing. You do the same thing to stay alive and to achieve happiness. That's what results in happiness, the achievement of your survival. So this is really as simple as uh, doing your chores to get your allowance. This is a simple analogy. You have to paint the fence in your front yard in order to get your allowance. Now, why are you painting the fence in order to get your allowance? Now, you can't get your allowance without painting the fence. So in exactly the same way, you can't experience happiness without being alive and achieving the values that allow you to remain in existence. So you can't get uh, happiness or pleasure without attending to your needs as an organism. In the same way, you can't get your allowance unless you paint the fence. But, also, the only reason to paint the fence is to get your allowance. Let's say, I, I chose chores rather than work because that just confuses the metaphor. Maybe you like work. I'm assuming you probably don't like chores or painting a fence. It's just an analogy. But you do the chore, you paint the fence for the purpose of getting your allowance. Now, that doesn't mean you don't really paint the fence or you can ignore that part no you have to have that part but you do it for the sake of your allowance it's the same thing with values and uh happiness or pleasure you have to attend to your needs as an organism but that's only worth doing like your chores because of those terms in which it cashes out in terms of conscious states. So I really do not like what Greg is doing here, which in my view is throwing what is right about the empirical approach under the bus in order to appease Jordan Peterson's distaste for conscious experience as the ultimate purpose, although not the standard. but. Anyway, if you remember that uh, chores and allowance example, that's that's it. There's that's ethics contained in a simple, clear, concrete uh, analogy. The basis of values is the requirements of life. Yes, true. But achieving your values only matters because it feels good. So yes, you definitely have to do what empiricists and hedonists don't do, which is name the actual source of values, which is the requirements of life. But it is not good to kind of weasel around and imply that things don't actually get cashed out in terms of conscious experiences, ultimately, because they do. As Ayn Rand said, man experiences the reality of his values in terms of pleasure. And experiencing your values is the only reason to try to pursue values. Now, the fact that you can experience values isn't what produces the metaphysical possibility of values. That's your requirement as an organism. But don't conflate the fact that life is the metaphysical source of values with the idea that life is the reason to pursue them and disconnected from how it feels to pursue and achieve them. Anyway, I think uh, Greg is 
muddying this point in order to appease Jordan Peterson. I mean, if I, I just think if I were an objectivist, just, um, or not an objectivist, just somebody interested, and I were listening to this, I would think, I, I would hear Greg lay out the empiricist approach and think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense as far as it goes. And then I would hear him say, that's wrong. And here's the objectivist approach, which he doesn't explain very well in my view, and I would come away thinking, okay, so that part he said that made sense isn't objectivism, and then I don't really understand what objectivism is. Maybe it has something to do with Jordan Peterson's intrinsicism, I guess? It seems to be what he's implying? Uh, so I think this, this was the most uh, disastrous exchange of the whole event. direct ourselves through life. How do we form these concepts? And can these concepts be formed based on fact in an objective manner, as opposed to just being found out there already, or, um, or just being made up and you can make up yours and I can make up mine and there's no way to tell if the Nazis or the Ku Klux Klan or the communists or we are right about what the values are. Um, so I think we have to take this question back to the broader question of how do you form concepts? And what kind of ways does perceptual evidence play in the forming of other? And in the case of value concept, and here I'm, I'm drawing on Rand as I usually do, um, what I think we do is at the deepest level, it comes from the needs of living organisms. There are certain ways they need to function in order to survive and prosper. And values are the way that we conceptualize that. They're the conceptualization, the, uh, so of a human value is in, held in conceptual form is an identification of something a human being needs to live. And he values it insofar as he chooses to live, and in some form recognizes that it will contribute to his life. But what I think ethics as a, a branch of philosophy, as a science in effect has to do, is really articulate the foundations of these values, where they come from, what the fundamental values are, what the fundamental ways of achieving them are is. So how but would you distinguish your perspective from the perspective of a Darwinian pragmatist? Then? So let me just say one more before I get to that. Yeah. So, but that, doing that as a philosopher, is a pretty sophisticated thing. People don't start doing philosophy until thousands of years, more than that, into living as human beings. This particular theory of the origin of values didn't come about until the 1950s. So in some sense, prior to that, human beings were identifying things as values in conceptual terms. We learn it uh, as we're kids. We learn that some things are good and some things are bad. And what a philosophical theory of values is meant to do is to articulate why that works, what it is that we're doing better when we do that. But other people who don't have the same theory than us will have some of the same values. And so we might come to the same conclusions, but without being able to fully defend and articulate them in the same way. I don't think it's coincidence that, that both of us think the Nazis were bad and the communists were bad, uh, even though we start in some sense from different places. But I think to fully develop and understand what's bad about them uh, and to come out consistently on the more difficult cases uh, of what's good and bad, uh, although the Nazis was a really difficult case for a lot of people, we should remember, and the communists still is. That's where we need, I think, to get down to the numbers. Now, you were asking me about the Darwinian approach. Well, because, you know, if, if, you're, if you're making the claim, which I think is it, it, it's, a, it's a justifiable claim, whether or not it's accurate, um, is that our ethics are grounded in something like the, the necessity, we could say the necessity for survival. Anyway, just, yeah, like I said, that I think that whole explanation was confusing and I get he's stressing the actual source of values but the way he does this just uh, he just throws experience conscious experience under the bus and then oh but here's the metaphysical basis for it he's why is he stressing it that way and I think he's stressing it that way and implying this view that values cash out in terms of uh, pleasure as Ayn Rand said He's kind of not saying that at all and kind of dismissing it because he's talking to Jordan Peterson, somebody who would be totally against the idea that you live life in order to feel pleasure or be happy. And so Greg is totally avoiding that point and just stressing to the point of being misleading and obfuscatory uh, the points on which objectivism allegedly agrees with Jordan Peterson. I don't know why I did quotes while I said allegedly. I really meant allegedly. I don't even know if you can see that in the camera, but anyway. 
survival and reproduction, which are variants of survival, obviously. That's a Darwinian claim. It's the claim that the American pragmatists advanced as well, because this is, this is um, Peirce and, and um, William James and primarily. Dewey, yeah. You know, they believe that your, your knowledge was a tool. Knowledge was a tool to advance being in the world, let's say, survival in the world, and that you justified your knowledge not because you had finite, final knowledge, of anything, but because your tools were good enough to obtain the end that you were aiming at. That was the validation process. If your theory was good enough to get you to where you were aiming, then it's, it was true enough. And the pragmatists believed that that was the best that you could do with truth. And then when Darwin advanced his theory, the American pragmatist said, oh, look, Darwin's theory is actually an extension of pragmatism. And pragmatism is the notion that your truths are good enough to facilitate your survival. But this is the rub. So that's Darwin. There's a, there's a truth that's embedded in the Darwinian worldview. That is not the same truth that's embedded in the Newtonian worldview. There's a conflict between those two. And the Newtonian worldview is basic, basically the world of facts, right? Roughly speaking. And there's a, there's a set of claims about truth that are based in a Newtonian worldview. And they're not the same as the ones that are based in the Darwinian point of view. It's a big problem. And part of the reason that I've been arguing with Sam for like three years is because he's an evolutionary psychologist in principle and a, bi a biological thinker and yet he essentially has a Newtonian worldview that it's the world of facts that's real it's like no no there's a world of values and the world of values is devoted not towards determining what's objectively true but towards facilitating survival and those are not the same thing so you see how angry and ugly he gets and how emphatic he gets when he knows what he's saying is BS. That's specifically when he gets really emphatic, when he knows he's on shaky ground. I don't like looking at that. Well, I like that logo better than his face. Um, <laughs> so, what, what, what? I see this, I've seen this filter out into followers of Jordan Peterson. This is, if you, if you think Jordan Peterson is good, Look at the ideas that are actually being spread by him. What is his actual effect? Not what you think of him overall, but what is the effect of his speech? What are the ideas that he is actually causing to gain popularity? And this is one of the most popular ones and most destructive ones. It's the idea that uh, Facts and values are at odds, that truth and good are at odds, that human flourishing and truth are not the same thing and are in fact at odds. This is how people actually talk after they've listened to Jordan Peterson. They make these points explicitly, this point explicitly. But that is completely wrong. What does that even mean? Darwinian science is about what facilitates survival, but Newtonian science is about truth. How do you think things survive? Well, before there's before consciousness even gets on the stage, it's just the interaction of physical phenomena. And once consciousness gets on the stage on any level, it's awareness of facts in order to facilitate survival. There's no conflict here. As Peikoff said, the good is a species of the true, and likewise, values are a species of fact. There is no conflict here. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's so crazy that something so false, so, so common, something that is so common sense can be twisted into something that, uh, People believe the opposite of what is obvious, as if the opposite were obvious. So this is for all those people who think, oh, how can societies ever change? Uh, people are just people. The same things seem obvious throughout all of history. No, they don't. No, they don't. What seems obvious to you is highly dependent on your culture. And Jordan Peterson is making some very bad, destructive falsehoods seem obvious to very many people. And this is one of the worst. The idea that, oh, your well-being and truth, those things are in conflict. Often your well-being requires you to ignore what's true, to violate what's true. 
Now, Jordan Peterson says, then he redefines truth on this basis and says, well, if it doesn't fit my desires, my needs, and it's just true in the physical external sense, that's not really truth. Now, again, I want you to consider whether somebody who believes this can be honest. Absolutely not. I'm certain on this point. No. <laughs> this is not complicated. Truth and good, and fact and value, go together like peanut butter and chocolate. You know, that's something that I heard people say. I never endorse because I don't say things unless I actually understand them or believe them, I guess, in this case, agree with them. But uh, I've recently been eating peanut butter and chocolate together, and they really do go well together. Uh, I used to be a chocolate purist. I wouldn't adulterate it with anything, but pretty good with peanut butter. Anyway, so... No, facts and values. What you need in order to survive and feel good, which uh, Jordan Peterson endorses, he says, oh yeah, usually we do things in order to survive and uh, uh, get what we want. Yeah, so that's supposed to be in conflict with facts. How is that in conflict with facts? Because it's pretty simple. In order to, we live in a factual world and are ourselves factual organisms. Therefore, in order to get what we want, in this factual world, we have to act on the basis of fact. Now, how you warp that obvious, in fact, self-evident fact into its complete opposite, and you make the complete opposite of the self-evident seem obvious to people, well, that is what Jordan Peterson is a master of, or, well, I don't know if I'd give him that much credit, but uh, that's what he's doing in any case. Uh, you know, if this, if this intransigent physical world is uh, against what's uh, good for you subjectively, then it's false. You know, Jordan Peterson actually says, this, this is what he actually means when he's talking about reconceptualizing truth. To Jordan Peterson, his idea is, if it turns out that discovering uh, the scientific uh, principles for building a nuclear weapon will lead to humanity building nuclear weapons which uh, lead to our extinction, then those scientific principles were false. That is Jordan Peterson's view. They're false. Because truth doesn't mean... <laughs> truth it doesn't mean what actually exists out there in reality it's not correspondence to reality it's what works for you for the species really so if something is impractical if there's an inconvenient fact or truth then it's false just because it's inconvenient that is jordan peterson's actual view He's discussed this with Sam Harris at some agonizing length. That is Jordan Peterson's view. If you don't like something, not true. That's what it boils down to. So, again, you consider whether that kind of person can be honest. Anyway, I said uh, all I have to say about this, I think and a new episode of my podcast will be up this coming monday as always and i will be thinking of more stuff to do videos on so i will see you next time bye